Well, now, we want to think of another facet of independence, and that is this personal independence. Uh, the children begin to want to do everything for themselves. They begin to try and dress themselves, to wash their own faces and hands, and so on. And again, uh, we do have very complicated clothes. I think the children's clothes at the moment are, have got very difficult for the children to manage. They were very much better a few years ago. And many of the little pants the boys wear are very tight. And they don't do up well around the waist. You know, you have to really squeeze them unnecessarily. Yes, which must be very bad indeed for their circulation. And I also think that it's very bad to have little boys in long pants all the time. You see, yes, all the summer they run about in long pants and the air and the sun never gets to the skin. Now, you uh, manufacture a gastrol in the presence of sunlight, you see, and then if you, uh, in the winter, you become immune to colds and things. But the sun on the skin is very necessary. I shouldn't have thought in this time that you needed to wear long pants at all. It's bad enough when you're an adult, but why should little three and four year olds be in there? It's only a fashion. Now, about eight years ago, it was a fashion to have little boys in the skimpiest pants. And they ran about in an English winter perfectly happily in little socks and skimpy pants, and they were actually healthier, you see, because too much clothing does the opposite to what you want, you know, because uh, the uh, air does the need, need to get to the skin. And I don't think all the nylon is too good, because I think that's one of the materials that the rays of the sun do not penetrate, and the air doesn't penetrate. Uh, a loosely woven cotton, a loosely woven wool, and the air goes through, the rays go through. I think we've got to start thinking about simple clothing for the children again, clothing they can manage, and clothing that is really healthy. Well, very often, of course, uh, it's difficult for the mother in the home because a child usually wakes up in the morning very fresh and full of energy and decides to start practicing on himself or herself first thing and the mother is bent on getting breakfast and getting the uh, older children off and it's difficult to have this small child sit on the floor uh, and refuse to do anything but take his socks on and off. <laughs> you <see>? but, <laughs> You have to go through that stage, and if you prevent him, then you are really preventing growth and frustrating him. Again, at first, he wants to, he usually starts, I find, they usually start with the socks because they can see their own feet. And it's very difficult to put on your, the rest of your clothes, very difficult to drop your buttons, because you can't see what your mother is doing when she just puts you on a coat and whisks your buttons or your zip. See? And that's why children so often, when they want to take their coat off, they'll pull like this. Oh dear, I've got pops. Um, <laughs> God, <no. laughs> and they'll pull themselves undone. You know? Well, they can't really, but they will try and get things undone in that way. Well, as far as putting on their socks goes, you do have to let the child. And the trouble is that he may put tw take 20 minutes to put on his sock and then he pulls it off again because he wants to do it again and again, you see. And um, if he ends up with it the wrong way round or inside out, again, we should not correct it. You see, it's awfully hard on a child because their mother then comes along and says, oh dear, this is inside out, or this is quite wrong, whips it off and puts it on again in the twinkling. It makes you feel really feeble and impotent, you see, and it drains the children of this self-confidence which they are building up. So therefore, when he has finally got his sock on, you should be very pleased with him. Oh, isn't that lovely? You can put your own socks on. And then, the next time, give him a very simple lesson in how to do it. See. But again, if when they make an effort and button their own coats, if they get a button in the wrong hole, we must leave it. We mustn't always be sprucing them up because 
we're going to take them out after all. It doesn't really matter for one day if the buttonhole is in the wrong button, you know. We must have this sensitivity towards their feelings and realize how very easily they feel that they can't do anything. See if we correct everything they do. Well, one way in which we can really help them is by letting them have all the different fasteners in turn. It's very difficult to do it on your coat. It's easier to do it on a frame, you see, which you can rest on the table so that it is, it is steady. And you can practice doing these buttons. You see, here's a frame with the large buttons. It's just two pieces of cloth, it's large buttons, and it is important to have only one type of fastener at a time. I see lots of copies of these things, and you will see somebody advertising an overall which has one button and one hook and eye and one zip and one something else. Now she scores a rather horrible a rag doll with us in which the, there was one button and one hook and eye and the mouth was a zip, which really I thought was a horrible oh. You know, uh, well a child could not learn to do all those things in one go, you see. So uh, we uh, have one of these dressing frames for each type of fastener the child is going to find on his own clothes. Now, fastenings do change from time to time and generation to generation. My grandmother wore something called button boots and she had, a, had to have a button hook to do them up. And then they wore kid gloves up to their elbows and they had a little button hook to do up the buttons. Well, we don't wear those clothes anymore. So it is, would be obsolete to give the child a frame in which the buttons had to be done up with a button hook. So if you see those in a Montessori catalog, that's because in 1900 they were necessary, but they, you wouldn't buy it because you don't get those today. Perhaps in a little while we should go back to them. The trouble today is they're always inventing new fasteners, aren't they? Each one worse than the last. So. Uh, if there's anything that is currently fashionable, you could always make one of these yourself. Or but you could buy the empty frame in England and make whatever's necessary. But these, uh, I think we have the basic ones here. You see the large button, size approximately of the coat button, and then a small button, approximately a dress or a shirt button. This one is poppers. Oh, now, this uh, language barrier. <laughs> They've got lots of names. They're called press fasteners. They're called poppers. Snaps. 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 Hooks and eyes. A dress zip, which I don't have with me. And this is the coat zip. The coat is the one that comes right undone they would first have a dress zip. And with us, we have two types of lacing. <coughs> the cross lacing is mainly what the women wear, and the bar lacing is the way the men do up their shoes. But I don't know that you have that difference. Some people still do. They mm -hmm. do. Then uh, the children do. In this unisexual world, you don't... And then a different, the, it's often used, the lacing is often used decoratively, and both lacings are used, you know, so it's as well to know both. And then, of course, bows. With the bow, it's much easier if the two ribbons are different colors. I think the buttons are uh, probably the easiest for a small child. And don't start worrying whether it's a boy's way or a girl's way, you know, because uh, 
<coughs> no, you can't possibly. You know, don't men go one way with you and girls the other. I think that's because you had to draw a sword and wear that a certain way, and your cousin's head and drew the other way up. So for some funny reason. But you don't need to worry about that with the children. Now first, you see, you need to give a very careful lesson in how you undo a button. So I've said how so many children don't know how to. And you hold the button hole between your finger and thumb, the, the button between the finger and thumb of the other hand, and you tip your button. You see, until it is vertical and then it just goes through the hole without stretching it. That's the right way to undo a button. Tip the button. And then the child likes to know that it's really undone. So if you turn one flat back, he can see that it really undid the thing. To do it up, you do just the opposite. You hold the button between the finger and thumb. I'm right-handed, so I would hold it between my finger and thumb, my left hand. You let it just appear through the button hole, and then you take hold of the button with your right hand, button hole with your left. You pull the button through, it's still vertical, and at the last minute you flatten it. Button in your left hand, just through the buttonhole, change hands, pull it out vertically and the last minute flatten it. In that way, you don't stretch your buttonholes. You know how a perfectly good coat has sometimes has sagging buttonholes because its owner doesn't know the right way to do the buttons up. Yes, they that's because they don't understand. You see, you can't see it. Nice. You can't see what your mother's doing when she buttons and unbuttons. Yeah. So uh, now, now, now the child will try for himself. At any point, he may take over from you. At first, they're very apt to get the buttons in the wrong holes and so on. You can give a new lesson. Yeah. And most uh, of these very simple techniques need to be shown more than once because although they seem so simple to us, they are really quite complicated techniques. When they're flattening themselves, do you think it's easier for them to start at the bottom so that they get the holes and the buttons the right I don't know, but I think that's when they often need a mirror, you know? You, f you think it's easier for them to start at the bottom? Because they can see it? Yeah. It's possible. I'm so used to doing it from the top down, isn't it? Yes, that is quite possible. Well, the small buttons are used in the same way. You, um, both frames would be there. The child usually begins with a bigger button because that is very much easier any time he can take the smaller button. I think you would then uh, present to the child anything that he had on his own clothes. I think uh, snaps are things you get on many of the duffel coats and things. Now here we do show him to put two fingers, one each side of the, of the uh, bottom cloth near the snap, and then to take hold of the cloth and pull. If you do that, holding the bottom piece of cloth down, your snaps don't get pulled off so often. Moves his fingers down for each one. And then you have to demonstrate how the little knob exactly goes over the hole. 
and you push the two together. Get the knob exactly over the hole. Push. They like this one because, of course, it does make that little snap noise. I have a lot of Velcro now. Mm -hmm. Velcro. Do you know what Velcro is? Velcro is a sticky material that sticks on. Yeah, oh, I know. It just rips off. But I need help with that, do they? I, I, can I, do they need to, uh, to learn that technique? Do you find who's got a national school? Do they have to learn that technique or Some do they the, manage it? They wear it in their, their jumpsuits. So I know, I've jumpsuits. seen it, yes. Yeah, so. They can do it themselves. In fact, someone sent me a coat that has it on the pockets. So. Yes. But do the children manage it easily for themselves or do they need to be taught how to do it? I think it just goes together. I don't think you would need one of these special frames, that's what I mean. <laughs> yes, well, you, you, anything you find is uh, suddenly, I say they're making so many different things today that when you find a need for something new, it's very easy to make a frame. For a time, our children had a very difficult wooden button uh, on duffel coats, uh, uh, a button that went on with a cord and a button hole made with a cord. And those are very difficult for them. And we had a frame, but now those have sort of gone out. Do you have them here? I think so, yes. They were in for a long time. I think they came in in the wall. Yeah. Yeah. I have a problem with little boys in their belt buckles. There are all kinds of, they wear belt, belts yes. with buckles. Is there a good way of... Uh, we did have one with straps. Uh, well, there should be one with uh, five straps and buckles, you know. Do you have various kinds of buckles? Or no, I, you only have one kind on one frame. You see, I, it's very confusing if you mix up two or three kinds. The whole technique is to simplify and give only one difficulty at a time. Usually, if you, you learn the normal bar buckle, then the children can manage uh, variations of the buckle. Um, no one can lend me that belt. <laughs> oh, that's that's a different kind, isn't it? Yeah. You, yes, they use those a lot now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. That's quite tricky, isn't it? The children are wearing them. Well, I think for this one, I would just have a belt in the classroom and a lovely buckle for them to polish it, brass polishing. It's really hard for them to work with that kind of brass polishing. It's much too difficult. That's what I say. We are giving the children clothes that are too difficult. This is the kind of buckle that we had five on the frame, you see. And the, you can always, the real way to undo these, you see, if you just pull it, nothing happens. But if you lay the strap right back and give just a tiny pull, then the t this brass tongue comes out without any difficulty. So you have to show the child the technique is to lay the strap right back Double it right back and then pull. And you see that has come out. And then to do it up, you have the strap flat back like that. You guide this into the hole with your finger, bring this up. There's always a, a right way of doing each fastening. So for these, we really need four or five 
Oh, the reason that we haven't got it at the moment, there was a saddler who specialised in horses' harnesses and mending harness, very near us, and he used to make them all for us, beautiful leather buckles. And he's suddenly uh, given up, you know, he got to retiring age and nobody else took the work on. So we haven't yet found a replacement for him. I think you do need a frame with the buckles. They need to be those good leather buckles. Now the lacing, I think you would lace your shoe for, towards you, don't you? So that you begin at the top. And you take your lace and you show them to put this uh, one tag up in the first hole on one side, the second tag up in the first hole on the other side. Hold the two tags together and you hold the material down with the other hand and you pull to get them the same length. Now you must keep your laces tidy while you do this. So you cross them. Then you pick up the lace on one side and you bring it up the hole on that side. Keep it along to that side. Do the same on the other side. Now you've got your first cross. You take your laces, cross them, and you just repeat that all the way down. Margaret, would you have that turned toward you and the child beside you? The child would be beside me. And you would have it the other way? I'd just have it like this. The child is sitting here. Well, you, so you would do it from the top? You see, that's like the top of his shoe towards him. I'm doing it this way. I, it's something I can't do upside down, you know. But the children manage it much better if you always keep your laces apart, tidy, so they can see what's happening. And they like this action of crossing the laces over. Oh, but the, the, this one, I think, is the one that you've got on all your shoes. I can't see if you have one on. You have the bar, do you? It's cross the bar first and cross Probably at this stage he doesn't um, know how to tie a bow, so when he comes to the bottom he just stops it. I, I, I need to do any more to finish it afterwards. Would it be too artificial to make each half in a different color so they can see where each side There's goes? no need to. These holes are very distinctive. I just think if we're... I, I don't I think, I, I've never had any difficulty with this. I don't, I don't think that will, is the point really here. I think it will be too jazzy as you say. You could have two different colored laces if you found a child wasn't, but then you'd have to knot them a little bit You could have a black and a white one. The child really wasn't managing, and not the cloth. I'll show you this one. You'll probably need a redemonstration in the um, lab class. You 
this one, you take one tab and go down the first hole. And you take the other one and go down the opposite hole. And then you hold your two tabs together and pull to get them even. See, and that, that has created the first bar. Now we have them to the side, parallel to each other. And we take one, and we bring it up the first hole. And we take the other, and bring it up in the next hole. So they're, again, they're both on the same side, parallel to each other. Now this first one has to come into this hole. This one has to come across to that hole. And this one has to come across to that hole. So we do the top one first. It has to come down this hole. That makes our second bar. Now this one, this one has to go in this hole, so this one will have to come up in this hole. has to come up in this hole. Now they're both the same side. This one will come across here and come up here. This one will come across here and come up here. There's no hole here, so the last hole is there. Child problem. If he can tie a bow, he does, and if he can't, <coughs> he just leaves the laces. Well, the back side is not the side you look at. And it's this used very much as a decorative lacing to that this one. Now bows. It's easier for the child if the two ribbons are in contrasting colours. And if a small child comes to school with shoes with uh, laces and bows, I think you're always wise to pretty quickly teach them how to untie bows because you do, otherwise you do spend a lot of time in a nursery school undoing knots, don't you? Because they pull the wrong bit of the bow, breaking your fingernails. So you can just teach them how to, show them very carefully, cut ends, and teach them just to untie a bow. And of course they like if you tie them up many times for them. So that's uh, all they would learn to do at first. I think the bow is a complicated thing to learn, so I always keep it, teach it in stages. We taught them how to undo a bow, I would then teach them only the half knot. Again, you want to keep your ribbons ironed and when you're doing this work, to keep them very tidy all the way.
Now the first thing we do is to cross our ribbons all the way down, laying them nice and straight. And then we have to a little bit exaggerate the arch. We hold the two ribbons together with our left hand and we have to go through the arch and catch the other ribbon and pull the half knot. Rather a big arch, hold the two ribbons together with the left hand, with the right hand through the arch, catch one ribbon. Or the opposite if you're left-handed, of course. I wouldn't be surprised because you're using both hands e equally if a left-hander can't do it the same way as a teacher, you know, because you're using your hands equally here. Now, and you must exaggerate and make rather a small loop close to the knot. Because the children are apt to make a big loop like this and the bow will fall to pieces. So make a rather small loop and then bring your other second ribbon round, keeping it flat. And you have to show the child how you get that piece between the two. He's already learned to tie the knot, remember, so he knows that half of the bow. Now when you have tied your bow, tie a straight bow the first time and don't fiddle with it. If you start, start poking and patting the bow to get it perfect, and the children always think that's part of the exercise, you know, and uh, they, you'll find them all tying a bow and then doing these useless fiddles. So, it's a very simple demonstration and leave your bow alone. And if anybody doesn't know how to tie a straight bow, I'll show you. Because some people tie a crooked bow, some tie an upside down bow. Just, it's very easy to show you how to do a straight bow. two different colors. Learning it in stages is a great help, having the two colors. Uh, before you go on to something else, uh, to prevent the, the bow, I mean, well, the shoelace from getting untied, there is one thing that can be done, and it's, uh, I found it to be absolutely foolproof. Uh, having been a school teacher and tying mm -hmm. shoelaces for the children, see, when the knot is being tied, um, well, turn the um, well the green ribbon into the yellow one more time. See, instead of doing it just once, do it twice. Uh, these are not shoes. These are heads, little girls' hair ribbons and oh, oh, I thought bows. This to, uh, no, this is a shoe. This is a shoe. Can you come and show us. Oh, okay. If it's not too difficult for a child. And it's you uh, very simple. For the children to learn too. Yes, I don't think I've uh, no, 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 no. Okay, you do it once, okay, and then just do it one more time. And it's foolproof, it won't come apart. Hey, I'll teach you to straight bow you're talking about. <laughs> You all know that. I've never seen it before. It's a bow that won't come undone. Oh, the whole thing will not come apart until the child's ready to take it apart. Oh, see, I think I think it grips. You see, you uh, you made a twist that grips. Mm -hmm. 
as I can see how that turned out. Oh, well, it's nice to know. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> My contribution to education. Well, <laughs> well, all of you prepare to give a contribution every time. Teaching them a the double bow also helps. Ah, but then the, the double bow, they come, it's very difficult to undo. They put, it doesn't un come undone with a pull. Again, they put it tight and you break them once again. And they've got too much shoelace. Then that takes up that extra shoelace. It's a hard, uh, hard job for the children to undo it. All right, then. But you must provide, you know, mirrors in the token and so on. Yes? We want the children to have a rich environment, but not a little rich environment. The children want a rich environment, but not an over rich environment. So, yeah, and how does, how does the teacher and the parent figure out where that morning is? Well, by not having a single thing you could do without, I think. Pardon? Not having anything that you could do without, you see. In the classroom, uh, most of the things are there for a purpose, aren't they? For a learning experience. And don't, don't be tempted with uh, a lot of extra pieces of equipment you keep seeing because very soon your room does get so cluttered that the children don't work. And your walls need to be, again, to have one good picture, perhaps two good pictures, but you don't want to clutter your wall space. Or you can't work in a room if every inch of the wall is bombarding you with pictures. So that's why I never put the children's work up on the walls. No, I don't ever. Uh, I mean, they have that, they can take it home. But you can't work in a, in a room. The, the room, whole room gets restless. If you really have to put the children's work up, put it in a corridor. But I always let them just take it home or put it wherever they kept their things. Oh, just two other things, quickly. The children also need to manage things like the different fasteners they meet on doors. <coughs> and one is the bolt. And so you would have a, a board with three or four nice strong bolts, you see, and you would show them, teach them to undo a bolt. You, would, and you see, it, it has a you have to stand it up, push it in, and then lay it down. This is the type of bolt you want. Uh, you're <laughs> so often children manage to lock themselves inside a room. And then having done that with the bolt, they have no idea as to how to undo it. So whatever fasteners they're going to meet first in the school, I would have a sample of that fastener on a board. But again, as with the dressing frames, you only have one type on one board. Too much that they have to cope with too, too many. And again, these are hinge sides, so you see you can just open them as you would open doors. Hmm? Oh no, you don't want any not, any true. distractions. No, you don't want any distractions like that. It well, has to be. You don't open the door and meet a mirror, you know. Do what? You do, that's not what you get. You yeah, know. I know. I would just want to that one. No, I think. I saw it once, once. No, these aren't toys. You see, these are real learning things. And uh, you don't you distract their attention from what they were really doing. You see, and well, here's the other type. You see, that uh, the hook goes into the eyelid. Well, like the ones we have on our cupboards. See? And the same thing. So, uh, 
any type they're going to meet in the school you would have on a board. I think these are the commonest types, aren't they? This is one that's easier for them to manage if they lock themselves in. But the bolt, because it, see it lies down, they're inclined to just try and push it and they can't. And then you have to get a ladder and rescue them, you know. All right, now. No, you don't want them to learn to open the type of bottle that you put dangerous drugs in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the ones that they're just going to meet, like screw tops, cork tops, you know, the ones you use as the washing up liquid, which push off and down. No, you don't want them to learn the other one. They're not going to meet it in their own mouth.